Okay, welcome back again. I'm Robert Breaker, and we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the Gospel of John. Last time we finished up in verse 14. So today we're going to start in verse 15 and learn about John the Baptist a little bit. But what we looked at last time was being born again. And we also saw how the book of John is a little peculiar, because here we go again with the message of who, <laughs> who Jesus is. And uh, it says there, verse 12, that believe on his name. So you remember, as we did our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, that before Jesus died in his earthly ministry, they were all asking, who are you? And in the early book of Acts, they were saying, who are you? So I call that the teaching of the who, or the who gospel, if you will. And it was all about believe on his name, believe on his name, believe who he is. And so you had this really strange thing where it was all about believe in the name of Jesus. So the book of John, as we said, we, we don't know if it was written after Paul or before Paul. Because it seems to be talking about some of the way that they talked before Paul. But yet, many scholars say, no, the book was written after Paul. Because some of the things in the book sound like Paul, like becoming a son of God, being born again, being begotten through the gospel, or born of the Spirit. So, this book is a mighty peculiar in the sense that it's going back to what the early apostles taught, and that was believe in the name, or believe on the name. But as we understand Paul and look at Paul, well, we don't really have a problem if we understand what it means believe on his name, the name of Jesus is uh, Jesus. J is short for Jehovah, and Sus is saves. So, if you believe that Jehovah saves, but you got to know how he saves. So you have to trust in what he did. So, you still have to have the message of what he did today. And we don't go too far into the book and boom, it's staring right at us, the message of what? And that is in verse 29 and verse 36, when he refers to Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. So I kind of see he's giving you the who message and the what message. So he's giving you both. But there's a whole lot in this book that sounds more like he wants you to know more of the who message than he gives of the what message. So like I say, I think John has written more so that Jews would believe that Jesus is their Messiah. And we saw that again, too. Remember uh, a couple of teachings ago at the end of the book, he tells us, chapter 20, why he wrote the book of John. Does it say in the book of John, I wrote the book of John so that you would trust in the blood atonement of Christ? <laughs> no, that's not what he says. He says in John chapter 20 and verse 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So he wrote this book so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ. Well, that sounds like a Jewish message to Jews. Jews knew to believe that Jesus was their Messiah or their Christ. So where is Paul's message of trust the blood atonement alone for salvation? Well, I don't see it, but I do see it in verse 29 and verse 36, kind of a foreshadowing of it in the sense that John says, hey, Jesus Christ, he's the Lamb of God. I don't even think John knew what he was saying when he said that. I think John just spoke with the Holy Spirit speaking through him. And this was something that John remembered. And he said, but I better write that down because that's the first time any one of us heard that Jesus is the Lamb. And that's pretty important in light of Paul preaching what he did as the Lamb or as the sacrifice. So let's get started here in John chapter 1 and verse 15. And before we start in verse 15, back up there in verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So Jesus Christ is God, the Son but he's also the Son of God. But look at the rest of that, full of grace and truth. Now that's going to be important here in a minute, because in verse 16 he mentions grace again, and verse 17 he mentions grace and truth again. So interesting, we have the message of grace, right? Paul was a grace preacher. Well, he's mentioning grace here too. So it's possible this book was written after Paul, and John writes it, but he's writing it to Jews to remind them, hey, you need to remember who Jesus was. 
And uh, like I said, maybe there's some stuff in this book that only John remembered because there's a lot in John that is not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which makes you wonder, why is he giving this added information that it wasn't in the other three? Unless, of course, maybe he understood some things from Paul, remembered some things that Jesus only told John, and he said, you know, now I see why Jesus was telling me this stuff. I better write that down. Okay? So, verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. So, John the Baptist is, is speaking here, and it's telling us, John is, that John the Baptist came to bear witness of Jesus Christ. And to tell people, hey, this is the one that you've been waiting for. This is the Christ, or the Messiah. So this is all about what we're about to read, Jesus being the Christ, or Jesus being the Messiah. And I will get into why that's important here in a minute, but that is, that is for Jews. Jews need to understand and believe that Jesus is the Christ and that he is the Messiah. So we start out here with John the Baptist. Now, who is John the Baptist? Remember, this is the book of John, but it's not written by John the Baptist. One of the main mistakes that Christians make as they're just learning to read the Bible is, oh, I thought the guy that wrote the book of John, the Gospel of John, was John the Baptist, but it's not. This is John the Apostle writing, and he starts out his book saying there's another guy named John who came as a precursor to Jesus and was announcing the coming of Jesus. That's who we call John the Baptist. Now, he wasn't a Baptist. Let me say that. <laughs> uh, there are some Baptist preachers out there that say the first Baptist was John the Baptist, and you just kind of scratch your head and go, that's pretty silly, okay? Um, because the church was founded with Jesus, not with the guy that came right before him. Be careful what you say. So why do they call him John the Baptist? Well, because, verse 28, he was baptizing. So John the Baptist, this John, came, and when John the Baptist came, he came preaching something, but he also came baptizing. So John the Baptist came to baptize. I, I did it in the English spelling, baptizing. There we go. So, water was the message with John the Baptist. Hey, you got to get into this water. And when you get in that water, confess your sins. And that's what that was about, and that's what he did. That was his ministry. Why? Well, we'll try to get into all that. And a matter of fact, the reason he did that, he tells us in verse 31 of John chapter 1. But I won't read that right now. We'll look at that a little later. But I want to ask the question, who was John the Baptist? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 1 and read verses 5 through 25 and just get a little introduction to who John the Baptist was. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, all the way down to verse 25. Luke 1, 5, and so John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus Christ. They would have been cousins, and he was born about six months before Jesus. And the Holy Spirit of God chose John the Baptist to be a preacher who came and preached and announced, hey, here comes Jesus. That's it in a nutshell, but I want you to read it and see it here in the Bible. There was in the days of Herod, Luke chapter 1 and verse 5, a king, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, that would be Abijah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So this, if she's of the daughters of Aaron, she would have been from the Levitical priesthood, I guess. And it says, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. So they kept their Old Testament law. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they both were now well stricken in years. So she's old, and she's thinking, I'll never have a baby. But then look what happens. And it came to pass, while he executed the priest's office before God, in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Now isn't that this wild? Old Testament, there's a guy named Abraham and his wife Sarah. And she's like, what, 90 years old? And she's thinking, I never had a child. And God gives them a, a child. It's a miracle. 
It's almost like a repeat. Here, she's old. She's like, I'll never have a child. And boom, God gives them a kid. God can do this. God can open the womb. This is a, uh, God can do whatever he wants. And God has done this time and time again. Miracles. Letting women have children when they're very, very old. Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Interesting. Many shall rejoice at his birth. And he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Wow. Now how's that tie into what we looked at last time? Uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit when we get saved. Well, this is a special thing here for this kid. He's got the Holy Spirit in him while he's in the womb. Now that's, wow, that's pretty amazing. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. So he's going to be a preacher. But think about who his father is. His father is a priest, which is a type of a preacher. So he's a preacher's kid. <laughs> but he's a good one. He turned out good. A lot of preacher's kids nowadays don't. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now who is him? The Lord, their God. Verse 16. So he's going to be coming as a precursor to God, to Jesus Christ. To her, turn the hearts of of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And it came to pass, that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So here he comes to Mary. Now, see what's happening here? The father of John the Baptist, he's struck and dumb. He can't speak. He's not able to speak at all until this child is born. And he's given a command, you name him John. And now the Holy Spirit is coming, uh, or actually Gabriel, the Holy Spirit is sending Gabriel to speak to Mary and tell Mary, you're going to have a kid. But look what it says here, in the sixth month. So Mary gets pregnant um, too. And so she's going to have a baby. Now, let's skip down there to verse 39. There's a lot to read here. Let's skip down to verse, oh, well, let's actually read verse 36. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this was the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days, and went into the hill of the country with haste into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias, and saluted Elizabeth. So now you got Mary, which would be the mother of Jesus, and then you have her visiting Elizabeth, who would be the mother of John. And John is in the belly of Elizabeth, while Jesus is in the belly of Mary. And watch what happens. <laughs> this is interesting. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Some sort of supernatural thing happening here with these babies. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Okay? And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So, wow, Elizabeth knew that Mary is going to give birth to the Lord. Wow. Verse 44, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So John is, is jumping inside of the belly of Elizabeth. Woo! Here comes. So even before he announced Jesus to the people of Israel, he knew in the womb. Isn't, isn't that wild? 45, And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, skip down there to verse 56. 
And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Which I'm sure, she's an old woman. She's Man, it would be hard to have a baby. They thought she might have died, but she didn't. Verse 59, And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to the father how he would have called. Remember, he can't speak. Nine months he can't even talk. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. And then on and on and on. So isn't that funny? He didn't believe God would give his wife a baby. And so they said, well, you're going to name him John. And he didn't get to talk. And he didn't get to talk until they said, well, we want to name him Zacharias. And he said, writes down, his name's John. And as soon as he did that, I can talk now. I thought, like I said, his name is John. <laughs> so that's how... This man, John the Baptist, is introduced. His father was a priest. Now, we're not told in the Bible hardly anything about what happens after that. Very little, as a matter of fact. For the next 30 years or so, we don't know how he lived or what. But he sounds like he's more of a mountain man, because he's out living in the wilderness, and he's eating wild meat and stuff. So let's turn over to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, and look at this guy, John. John would have been a weirdo in the eyes of many people, but he also would have been like one of the prophets. A lot of these prophets, God called them to be apart from the people, and God provided and took care of them, and they lived out of the wilderness where they were given revelation by God, and then they were told to go now and preach to the people of Israel. And that's where a lot of our Bible comes from, these prophets speaking, and it was written down. So this guy, John the Baptist, was a prophet. And in Matthew chapter 3, let's just read verses 1 through 4, just to give you an idea of him and what he was like. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So he's in the wilderness. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is he saying? He's saying that Jesus is about to come and set up his kingdom. The Messiah is about to come. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Now that would be the prophet Isaiah. Now a lot of people say, Why does the King James Bible say Isaiah? Well, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and transliterated from Hebrew, it's Isaiah. In the Greek language, it's Isaiah, so they translated, transliterated from, from Greek, and it's more Isaiah, but we know that it's still talking about Isaiah. So this is the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. What? That is actually coming from the Old Testament. And we'll look at that here in a minute, but <clears throat> he's quoting Old Testament. So that shows you that out in the wilderness, he must have sat around and read the Old Testament over and over and over. In verse 4, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. So he killed a camel and made his, his coat or his suit, <laughs> his vesture, uh, his clothing was camel skin. So he had a fur coat. Boy, that must have been itchy. I mean, I just mm, that just sounds strange to me. But he would eat locust and wild honey. He was living on a diet of insects and honey. Then went out unto him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So Israel looked at him as, he's a prophet, and we accept him. Now, interesting thing about him, one of the last books in the Bible was written before John about 400 years. And so we had 400 years of silence. The Old Testament had finished, it was closed, there, there were no new books of the Bible being added. If I remember right, was it Malachi was the last book of the Old Testament, if I remember correctly. And for 400 years, there was nothing until about that time. And then, boom, God starts speaking again to Israel. And that's something after 400 years of silence. And so the people of Israel, they were hungry. They were waiting. They were wanting a prophet. They were wanting someone that would come and, and teach and preach to them. Now look at verse um, 7, Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his brother, and he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. 
And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. <laughs> and then 11 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Oh, now a lot of people claim to be Christians. They say, I want that fire baptism. I want the baptism of fire. No, you don't. Do you see there's a colon right there after fire? The next verse tells you what that fire is. And that fire is hell. So John the Baptist is saying heaven or hell. You can come to God and be baptized with the Holy Spirit, or you can reject Him and be baptized in fire and burn. That's what he's saying. So choose one, please. Look at what it says in verse 12. The fire is, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire, well, that's the fire of hell. So that would be hell. So he's giving you a real heaven or hell message. And look how he's, he comes and he's saying to the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, Hey, you guys are to blame. Why? Because when he came, he came in a time of apostasy. So he was pretty critical, right? <laughs> right now, we're in a time of apostasy. And do you realize the Lord's about to come back at the rapture to take us to heaven? Jesus came in a time of apostasy back here. Jesus is coming again in a time of apostasy over here. So there you go. You have John the Baptist. He's an interesting fellow. Let's go to uh, John again. The book of John chapter 1. And uh, he's kind of a little country guy, country preacher. And he preaches hard. And he preaches against things that he sees that are evil. And he tells people, man, you're a bunch of sinners. And you need to confess your sins and you need to get right. And he attacks the religious leader of the day. Telling them, you're a bunch of vipers. You're a bunch of liars and deceivers. Boy, he didn't put up with much. He called a spade a spade, I guess, as they say. So why was he coming preaching in water and, and telling them to get water baptized? What was that about? Well, because he's coming to announce the king. And that's what Jesus is. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the king. You realize if somebody invited you to, to go see a king or maybe a president or something, wouldn't you want to be clean? Wouldn't you want to be cleaned up? Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to put on your best clothes to meet a dignitary or something like that? So going back to John chapter 1, look what it says here in um, verse 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So he's saying the word was before me, because the word is God in eternity. But he says, now I want to point you to the Christ. So John the Baptist, he's saying, I'm pointing you to him. And I want you to know it's not about me, it's about Jesus. So he was a hellfire, brimstone, Jesus preacher. <laughs> preached against sin, preached against false uh, denominational uh, teachers. And he preached, you've got to come to Jesus, you got to come to Jesus. Well, then it says here in verse 16, John chapter 1, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. What is he saying? We were the Jews. So here's saying, he's saying we received a lot of grace from this guy. Well, how could that be true if he hadn't shown up yet, unless he was God? So I think John the Baptist knew Jesus Christ was God, and so he's telling them, hey, this is the Messiah, but this is also God manifest in the flesh, and y'all need to come to him, because he is the promised seed that was prophesied in the Bible, and you need to accept him. Now verse 17. Hmm. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So he comes here and he goes, okay now, the law, you know the law started with Moses. The law came by Moses, but Jesus came, and Jesus came to bring grace, and that's what we call the church age today, the age of grace, and truth. So it's a different dispensation. There's something changing. Something going to be happening that's different. So it's not going to be the same old way that they were doing it. Now, here comes Jesus. He says, now we're going to do it this way. I believe in dispensations. They're in the Bible. So the law to Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Now, if you know your Bible... 
and I don't know if you do, I hope you do. If you know your Bible, we have Old Testament, New Testament. And that's, we as Christians have that. We have 66 books. Now, the Jews, they only have, I believe it's the 39 books of the Old Testament. Now, they also have some other books as well, but the established known books of the Old Testament, they have, they call them the Torah. These are the Jewish writings. The Torah, the Nebim, Nebim, and sometimes they use a V instead of the B, and the Keth Abim. The Torah are the first five books that we call the Law. The Nebim are the writings of the prophets. And the Kethabim would be other writings. And so these are what they had to read. So the Jews read these over and over and over, and boy, did they read them. And the last thing they had to read in the Old Testament would have been the last thing given to them, and that would be the book of Malachi. And so let's go over to the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 4. Malachi 4 tells us, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. So remember the law of Moses. So all the Jews believed in the law of Moses. Now they would have read the prophets too. So the Jews followed Moses' law. But in Moses' law, there was a promise of a coming seed. So Moses, in the law, wrote about the promised seed. And this was a promise of a seed that was one day coming that would come to Israel. And it went all the way back to Adam. So they read their Bible over and over and over. And they said, I wonder when that promised seed is coming. Now go to um, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. First... Um, prophecy in the Bible. Genesis 3.15 And it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there's a seed that the devil gets, but there's also a seed of the woman. And this is what's called a promise seed. And many of the Jews looked at this as someday God's going to send some sort of a seed that's a promise to us that will deliver us and make everything back the way it was before Adam and Eve sinned. Well, here he comes, Jesus Christ. But the Bible prophesies of him also in these other writings as well. And let's just look at this also, because as we go through this, we're going to see um, that the Jews come and ask a couple of questions. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Jews would have known their Bible, okay? And the Jews would have looked at the Bible, at the law and the other writings, and they saw the prophecies in it. And the law prophesied of a seed, but the law also prophesied of a great prophet who would come. And so look what it says about this prophet. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. And the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet, capital P, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So that way we know today, looking back, is Jesus. But also the book of Jeremiah chapter 23. Let's go to Jeremiah 23. Also, it prophesied that this coming prophet would be a king. A king. So Jeremiah chapter 23, and these Jews, all they did was sit around and read their Bibles. They were commanded to, and many of them did. So they would have known these prophecies. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, and I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And for fun, let's read verse 6 too. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So he's the Lord. So the king, he's the Lord, he's called a branch, he's called the king, and he's called the Lord our righteousness. And he's a seed. So these are all prophecies of a coming what? Christ. And the Jews called that prophecy of that coming one, they called him their Christ or their Messiah. Now the word Messiah, oh, in Hebrew is Mashiach, means the anointed one. 
and a king is anointed. You anoint the head of a king, okay, with oil. So they're waiting for this king, and if you think about it, they are now under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. So they don't have a king. And so they're thinking, man, we sure wish this guy would show up, that's in the Bible, and deliver us from Caesar, and deliver us from these Roman people like Herod and things like that. So this is what the thinking was of the Jews at the time, is there's going to be this thing coming that's going to be our king and our deliverer and our Lord. Well, if you know your Bible, Jesus tells us that the whole Old Testament speaks of Jesus. So the Old Testament is all about Jesus. Let's look at a couple verses on that. And unfortunately, many Jews today do not realize that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. And if you say that, they get angry. Go, oh, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. And yet he was. And we see that because we have the New Testament. But they're blind. The New Testament tells us that they're blind, but that their eyes will be opened after the rapture in the tribulation period. They're going to see. They're going to have Moses and Elijah sent to them again. And they will see those as the two witnesses, and they'll be like, oh man, we missed it. We, we killed the Messiah. But in John chapter 5 and verse 29, Jesus is speaking. I said 29, it's 39. John 5, 39. Jesus says in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. Okay, that would be the Old Testament, because at the time that's all they had. Today we say, let's search the, all the scriptures. Let's, let's search the New Testament too. But at the time that Jesus is speaking, all there was was the Old Testament. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So Jesus says the Old Testament scriptures testify of me. As the promised seed, the prophet, the branch, the king, and the Lord. Now, go to Luke 24. In Luke chapter 24, here comes Jesus Christ. And in Luke 24, look at verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So he's risen from the dead, and he's walking with these people, and he's talking to them. And he says, The prophets, all that they've spoken, is all about me. Because then he says this in verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expanded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus literally gave these people a one-on-one -on -one Bible study and said, remember all this in the Old Testament? That was all about me coming as the Messiah. Whew, what an amazing thing. Now look at Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44, Jesus says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So the law, Torah, prophets, Nabim, and then Psalms, Kethabim. So he says that they were all written about Jesus. Wow. So you turn back to John chapter 1. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the law was given by Moses all about Jesus, who is coming to show grace, and who is the truth. Because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And then in verse 18, No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. All right, now verse 19. So he, he goes back to talking about John the Baptist, and here's what happened when John the Baptist started his ministry in verse 19. But before we go there, let me back up real quick, and let's go to Matthew eleven thirteen. Okay, Moses gave the Old Testament law, but grace and truth came with Jesus Christ. Let's look at this real quick. Matthew eleven thirteen. In Matthew eleven thirteen, look what it says here. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So the Old Testament law and the prophets were all written until John showed up. Because something new is going to come with John. And John's going to announce the coming of the Messiah. I think that's interesting. Now let's go to Luke 16, 16. So if you read your Bible, you cannot come to any other conclusion than there are dispensations in the Bible. And the law was one dispensation, then Jesus showed up to begin a different dispensation, a time of grace. Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. So the law and the prophets up to John. So John came as another prophet and began to tell people, here comes Jesus, here comes Jesus. You need to listen to and accept him. Um, very quickly, very quickly, I need to ask this question. 
Are we still under the Old Testament law today? Well, the Bible says that the Testament begins with the death of a testator. So Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross. He died. So by shedding that blood, and it's purple now because I used purple the other day. <laughs> um, it's purple. Here's the red. Okay. So Jesus shed his blood on the cross, and that blood that he shed on the cross is what started the New Testament. So you have New Testament, and you have Old Testament. So there's definitely, clearly, a change. So there are dispensations in the Bible from Old Testament to New Testament. Some people that claim to be Christians say, well, we're still under the Old Testament law. Well, no, we're not. And again, the Law and the Prophets were until John. So the law was really up to John. Then it began to start a little change. Then with the death of Jesus, then we saw another change. And then from Jesus, we see the early apostles... And then we see it going to the church. So it's important that we understand that the Old Testament law was for Israel. And because they rejected their Messiah, now we're not under the law, we're under grace. All right, let me show you some verses on that. Let's go to Acts chapter 13 and verse 29. Acts 13, 29. There are some people out there that say, no, 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 we're still under the law. Well, then they don't know what they're talking about. And one of the biggest ones, a uh, group in the world, is what's called the Seventh-day Adventist. And the Seventh-day Adventist church say, we are still under the Old Testament law, and we must keep the Sabbath. Do they read their Bible? The Bible says we're not under the law, so we're not under the Sabbath. So that is wrong, what they are teaching. Matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 31, don't, you don't believe me? Fine, read it. In Exodus 31, it says to kill people that don't keep the Sabbath. If we're still under the law, then we should be out killing people who don't keep the Sabbath. But do not do that. I do not recommend that. I do not preach that. I don't tell people to do that. As a matter of fact, I tell them the exact opposite. Don't kill people. Because the Sabbath was for Jews. And in that passage, Exodus chapter 31, it says it is for Israel as a perpetual sign forever. So it is not for us today. The Sabbath is not for us today. And that's how messed up they are in their doctrine, believing that we're still under the Old Testament law and we have to keep the Sabbath. Acts chapter um, 13, verse 29. Acts 13, 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. So Jesus fulfilled everything that was written of him in the Old Testament up until that point of his dying for the sins of the world. Then he rose again. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Many of these um, Seventh-day Adventists, and boy, do I run into them all the time. A lot of times they come to my channel and go to my comments. Robert Breaker doesn't know what he's talking about. We're still under the Old Testament law. What do they do with verses like this? Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That doesn't sound like we're still under the law. It sounds like the death on the cross was the end of the law for righteousness. And that today we're saved by faith and not by the Old Testament law. So clearly, we are no longer under the law. But no, Robert Breaker, we're under the law. And again, I say, okay, that's your opinion. Here is scripture. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So we are not under the law, we're under grace. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Look at what Jesus did when he died on the cross. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that would be the law, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So when they put those nails in his hands and his feet, he that didn't sin one time, he fulfilled the law, he put the law on the cross and said, see there, I fulfilled the law. We're no longer under the law. My blood pays as the one-time sacrifice for all. Now you can be saved by grace and not by the law. So the Bible is very clear. We're not under the law, but under grace. Go to Acts chapter 15. So these people that claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, which by the way, do you know where Seventh-day Adventism started? With Miller. Did you know they used to meet in an insane asylum <laughs> in Battle Creek, Michigan? I've actually been there, and I've looked at the place. 
Uh, I didn't go inside, but I looked at it from a distance, the place where they used to meet their early meetings. Would you trust a denomination or a religion that started in an insane asylum? Not me. I mean, can they read? If they could read, they'd see we're no longer under the law, but yet they're trying to put people back under the Old Testament law. That's so sad to me. Because we're not under the law, we're under grace. Acts chapter 15 and verse 5, look what it says. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law. So during the early church... There were some people that came, came over and said, no, 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 we still got to keep the law. What happened? There was much disputing, verse 7. <laughs> verse 6, the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And what does Peter say? Peter says in verse 11, but will he believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they? Peter says, no, no, it's not the law anymore. See, Christ is the end of the law, just as Paul said. No, it's grace that saves us, not the law not the keeping of the law. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. So if you're in a denomination and they tell you that you are still under the Old Testament law and you've got to keep that Old Testament law, I don't know what else to say except to say it like this. You are in a cult that does not rightly divide, that doesn't read their Bible, and is not teaching the truth. Here's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth might be stopped and that all the world might become guilty before God. Who was under the law? The Jews. Are we under the law today? No. Christ is the end of the law. We're under grace. Verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is not bad. It shows us what sin is, but the law cannot save you. But people today think, if I do good and I keep the law and I do works, God will save me. That's not what the Bible says. It says there in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So it's not with the law. It's righteousness of God without the law. It's not our righteousness of keeping the law that saves us. It's trusting the Lord, our righteousness, and now I'm saved by grace. Verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? Is it excluded? By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. <laughs> This was the Old Testament law of works. And that's what it was. It was the law of works. And in the Old Testament, you had to do works to be accepted of God. Today, it is the law of faith. And it is through faith that we are saved. It is no longer the law. And that's just what the Bible teaches. And so look what it says here in verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So the law is not what saves us, and we don't keep the law to be saved. We're saved by faith, not through the law. Now that I'm saved, I'm going to live right. And when I do live right, guess what? I'm doing good. The law tells you what to do good. Well, I'm doing good because I'm led by the Spirit, not by the flesh. The law was all about doing this, that, and the other thing in the flesh. Go to Acts chapter 13. Let me show you Paul's message here. And uh, Paul's message was, you can't be justified by the law. Only through faith. Only through grace. Acts 13, 38, and 39. Paul said, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Who is that man? Jesus Christ. And by him, all that believe, believe is faith. By him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You see, the law of Moses cannot save you. You cannot be justified by the law of Moses. That will not save you. Go to Romans um, real quick, chapter 7. Do you realize you're an adulterer? If you're trying to get back under the Old Testament law, 
because you're telling Jesus, I don't want you. I'd rather have this instead of you. Wow. Romans chapter 7 says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be buried to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. <laughs> verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law. How could anyone say, well, but you got to keep the Old Testament law. No, 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 but you got to keep the, the Sabbath. <laughs> That's someone that has no idea what they're talking about. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says we are under the law of faith today, and we're saved through faith, not the law. So watch out for these people that try to get you back under the law. Let's go to Galatians. The whole book of Galatians is all about that. They were trying to get people back under the law. And the book of Galatians is Paul writing and saying, no, 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 no. It's not the law. It's not the law. And look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. Galatians 3, 10. But as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. So are we still under the Old Testament law? No. No. What was the law? Verse 24, the law was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And since we're in Galatians, let's go to Galatians 5.4 real quick. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So if you ever try to say, no, we're still under the law, you got to keep the law, what are you doing? You're saying, no, I don't believe in this Jesus guy who brought grace and truth. No, I'd rather be over here. I don't want to go over there. What are you doing? You're denying the blood of Christ. You're denying the dispensational change. You're denying that Jesus came to die for the sins of the world and that it's through faith, through grace, through faith that a person is saved. Why would you do that? You're no better than the Pharisees of old that killed Jesus Christ. You need to read your Bible and know your Bible and understand your Bible. Now, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, and that was to Jews back then, before John showed up, but then it says, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's over here, and that's now. We're not over there. We're over here. Different dispensation. Verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but we also saw in the beginning of chapter 1, he is also God. So he's God the Son. Verse 19, and this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? So this is John the Baptist, and he's giving a record. So what John is doing is he's telling us what this other John said and did. So he is a John telling about the ministry of another John, John the Baptist. And the first thing we see here is, Who art thou? So we see the Jews showing up, and the first thing they say is, Hey, who are you? Isn't that funny? There's your who message right there. And so they ask him, who, who are you? Now, who is this asking? The priests, the religious leaders, which, by the way, were apostates because they were not reading and teaching. As a matter of fact, when Jesus comes in his ministry, Jesus says, why are you guys stealing from people? Why are you doing bad things? Why are you lying? Why are you such hypocrites? So Jesus calls out the religious leaders and says, you're all fakies. You're fakes. And you're liars and you're deceivers. You're not preaching what I said. Now, look what it says here again in verse 19. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? So, question is, who? Well, verse 20, And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So they came to him and they said, Hey, are you the Christ? 
Are you the Messiah? Are you the anointed one? Are you that one that all these scriptures in the Old Testament say is coming? Are you him? And he confessed to them and he says, I am not him. So verse 21, they ask him, what then? Art thou Elias? Elias is Elijah, okay? The reason it's not Elijah, it's Elias, is because Elijah is how we uh, translate or transliterate from Hebrew. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek. So in Greek, it's spelled Elias. So the translators of the King James translated from Greek, but they knew that it was really Elijah. But they said, no, we're going to keep it as close to the originals as we can. So when you read through this, you know that Elias is really Elijah. There's no problem. A lot of Christians, they get saved, they go, oh, who's Elias? Well, you just have to know that he's talking about Elijah. And it's not hard because a lot of times it'll say Elias, and you hear the, the uh, quote of the prophet, and you go, oh, yeah, that's Elijah. So you know that. But I just want you to know that's why it says Elias. Elias is Elijah. And they ask him then, art thou Elias? And he saith unto them, I am not. He saith, I am not. Why on earth would they ask him, are you Elijah? Well, go back to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And look at what it says. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. It shows you that these Jews were reading their Bible, and they were thinking, in our minds, it's got to be fulfilled, this prophecy. And look what it says. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So they're reading their Bible and they said, hey man, the Bible says that uh, Elijah is coming. So they said, hey, are you Elijah? And he confessed. And what did he say? He said, I am not. Now, I don't have time to get into this, but if you want to have a fun Bible study on YouTube, I have a video entitled, it Was John the Baptist Elijah? Because Jesus said in one passage that he kind of was but then he explains it later and says, well, had they accepted him, that he would have been in the spirit of Elijah. And he would have been accepted as Elijah. If the Jews had accepted Jesus as their Messiah, then the Millennial Kingdom could have come in back here. So God always has you know, a plan B. But they said, art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. John 1.21. And again, in John 1.21, he says, art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Who is that prophet? Well, we just read it a few minutes ago. That's in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, and that's verse 15 and 18, where Moses prophesied and said, I will send you a prophet. So verse 22 of John, John chapter 1, verse 22, Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to him that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And so he says, Oh, oh, you want to know who I am? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you who I am. And look what he says. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah. Okay, so this is Isaiah. Well, that's Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. Now, he says, oh, you want to know why I'm here? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, when he said that, he just didn't pull that out of his head or just say that off the cuff. He's going back to an Old Testament verse in the book of Isaiah. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter 40. And he's a quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. So that shows me that the whole time he's out in the wilderness eating locusts and honey, he's reading his Bible. And God the Holy Spirit is telling him, now this is about Jesus. Now this is about... So he would have had a Bible education and known what the coming Messiah would have been like. And so he could look for him. Isaiah chapter 40. And um, unfortunately, I guess I don't have time to read all of Isaiah chapter 40. But there in verse 3, it says, The voice of him that prepareth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So, who is Jesus Christ? He's God. Just another verse that proves the deity of Christ. Now, if you read all that, you'll come across some interesting stuff. Look at verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Jesus says in the book of John, he's the great shepherd. So John is an amazing book. There's a lot of stuff in John that points back to Jesus in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there's a writing about when the Messiah comes, he's going to be a shepherd 
And Jesus says, I'm the shepherd. So all the things that Jesus is saying in the book of John, he's going back to the Old Testament scriptures that are about him. So I can't wait to get into John even more and look at all that. And uh, so let's go over here to verse 20. And it says, and he confessed and denied not, but confessed I am not the Christ. Then he says he's not the Elias and he's not the prophet. And so they say in verse 22, who are you? Who are you? Well, why are they asking who he is? And why did they even come out there in the first place? Well, there was a prophecy in the book of Daniel. And way back here in the book of Daniel, there was a prophecy. And it was a prophecy of 70 weeks. But it was a week of years. So it would have been a prophecy of 490 years. But then the last year hasn't been fulfilled yet. So it was a prophecy of 483 years. And guess what? From when all the things in that book happened, sure enough, it was almost exactly the same time <laughs> when Jesus showed up that the prophecy of Daniel said that this coming king or Messiah would show up. That's actually in Daniel chapter 9, verses uh, 24 to 27. And it's actually verse 25 that talks about the Mashiach or the Messiah. And that means anointed one, Christos in Greek, the anointed one. So the Jews knew that their Messiah or their Christ, their anointed one, their king was coming. So they said, well, this must be the new prophet. Let's go out and find out. And uh, that's what they did. So when he said, no, I'm not the prophet, I'm not Elijah, they were like, well, he's not the Messiah, and he's not Elijah coming to tell people the Messiah. So who are you, basically? What sayest thou of thyself? Verse 22. 23, he just quotes an Old Testament verse. Then in verse 24, they which were sent were of the Pharisees. Now, I find that interesting. I don't have time to get into that. We're running low. But during that time, there were Pharisees who were the religious leaders, and there were sad, you sees, who were not that happy because they were sad, you see. No, I'm sorry, bad jokes, a bad joke. But the Pharisees were the only ones that came out. The Sadducees didn't. Why is that? Well, if you go and get a chance, read Acts chapter 23, verse 6 through 8. There were two main religious groups that were leaders of the Jews during that time, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the Sadducees were kind of the liberals. They didn't even believe in a resurrection. So they were kind of like your liberal apostate. They were the more apostates than, than the Pharisees. <laughs> and uh, so they weren't that great. So I guess they didn't even think it was important to even go out there and look. So they sent the more religious people, the Pharisees. So the Pharisees asks, verse 25, they then ask, and they asked him and said unto him, why? So they went from who as the question, who are you? Then they say, well, well why? So they ask who, then they ask why. I find that interesting. So who, now why? And then they said this. Why baptize this then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? So why are you baptizing if you're not Elijah and you're not the Christ? Why are you even doing this? Verse 26, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. Now to unloose is the opposite of to loose. A lot of times read, people read this and they think unloose, they think loose, and they think you know, unloose something. If it's loose, then you're tying it. So he's saying I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes, basically. Uh, that's how unworthy I am compared to him. So this is interesting. So the Pharisees asked this. And by the way, the Pharisees were the ones who, ki who killed Jesus. They were the ones who killed Jesus. But the question is, why? And the answer from verse 26 to 28, the answer to why he's baptizing was to get people prepared and ready for the coming of the Messiah. And so he says there in uh, verse 31, the answer and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So the reason he baptized with water, in his own words, was to show people the Messiah. Because he's getting people ready. He's getting them to be clean, right? You don't want to go before a king dirty. So he's saying, get washed, get clean, get right with God, repent, confess your sins, get all clean, because in a second, your king's going to show up, and you want to be on your best behavior and in your best clothes, and you want to be clean. And so that's what it was all about. So that's interesting. 
Verse 28, these things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. And there's a lot more to go here. So I guess we'll stop here in verse 28. And we will pick it up next time in verse 29. Because there we see the Lamb of God, <laughs> which taketh away the sin of the world. Which, by the way, he says twice in verse 36 as well. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So I hope you got a hold of this today. Uh, we'll just have to put off the rest of chapter 1 till next time. But did you get it? John the Baptist is there, and he's there to be the one who points them to Christ. So God in heaven, we read that in the beginning, chose John, even chose his name. And somehow, for some reason, even put the Holy Spirit inside of him while he was still in the womb of his mother. So while he was still in the womb of his own mother, John the Baptist had the calling of God in his life. And his calling of God was to be the one that presents to the world the Messiah and the King. You know what's interesting? Jesus Christ's ministry was only about three and a half years. John the Baptist's ministry, John the Baptist was only six months younger than Jesus. So John the Baptist had about a three and a half year ministry, if even that long. It could have been less. But however long it was, it was very short. And it presented the Messiah. And then John the Baptist was killed by Herod, and he was killed because he was preaching against sin. And the lost world said, we, we don't want to hear that. To this day, the lost world does not want to hear people call them a sinner or talk about sin. They get angry. And they chopped off the head of John the Baptist because he said, you're a fornicator, or you're an adulterer, Herod, and it's not right for you to do what you're doing. So there it is. Next time we'll start in the next verse, and I wish I could have got through the whole thing today, but I did the best I could. And I look forward to our next study on the Gospel of John. God bless you. We'll see you next time.